Hello and good afternoon. I'm Annalena Kleskulik, EOA Deputy Director for Policy Coordination and Foresight, and I will be your host for the next hour. I'm very glad that you're joining us today for the EOA webinar on contributing to evidence-based policymaking, universities and science advice in times of uncertainty. That's a big title. One may of course say that all times are uncertain as there are always many things that are not really in our control. But currently, or at least for the last couple of years, we may perceive this uncertainty even more as change is accelerating on many different levels. Pressure on political, economic and social systems is further increasing as we move from the pandemic into a new phase of major geopolitical tensions, not least due to the Russian war on Ukraine. And this has fundamentally changed international political geometries as well. So political decisions in these times of crisis have to be taken often quite fast, um, sometimes also outside of regular policy making processes. We've all witnessed that during the pandemic in different ways in our countries. But what does that actually mean for evidence based policy making? Evidence-based policymaking is an important element of knowledge societies and of modern democracies and universities and researchers and science advisors very much contribute to this. In different countries, we have different ways of integrating the science advice into policymaking, sometimes with specific committees on, on certain topics with commissioned research through independent um, individual experts and academics. And the pandemic has shown the value as well as the challenges for science advice and policymaking, which raises a number of questions for the future. How can we make sure that um, scientific results are used appropriately in political decision making? What is the role of universities and individual scientists in this? And may we actually need new science advice mechanisms for the future? All of this, these questions we would like to explore in the next hour. Um, and before we do this, uh, and you all can lean back, um, we have a short poll um, here that you uh, as a participant may wish to answer. What do you see as the biggest challenge for science advice currently? There are different possible answers that you can submit. And while you do this, I will briefly welcome my three speakers that are here with me today. Um, we have first Mathieu Denis, Acting CEO and Science Director of the International Science Council in France. He's Canadian with a long-standing experience as a researcher in Europe and Canada, and also the former Executive Director of the International Social Science Council. And then we have Philip Nolan, Director General of the Science Foundation Ireland since the beginning of this year. He's a professor in medicine and previously also served as chair of the Irish Epidemiological Modeling Advisory Group during the COVID-19 pandemic until early this year. And before that, he has also more than 10 years experience in university leadership, notably as former president of Maynooth University. And last but not least, we have Jakob Kosmanen, Chief Coordinator of the Science Advice Initiative Finland at the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters, and also with previous experience as researcher and consultant working at the Science Policy Interface. So we will start with a short round of presentations and then have some follow-up questions and also some time for discussion. I see many of the participants are already sending greetings from the different places and countries where you are, you can do this in the chat. Um, if you wish to ask a question to the speakers, you may um, indicate this in the Q&A section. So please don't write it in the, in the chat, but in the Q&A function. And then my colleague, Caroline, who's very active in the back end, um, whom you can't see now, but she's um, looking at the, at the Q&A. She will publish the questions and I will then um, do my best to select them. As a participant, you can also vote them up. So if you like a question of someone else and you would like me to pick it, you can just vote, vote it higher up in the list. Um, these were the few housekeeping rules. Now we can actually have a look at what you've answered in the poll. 
I, I can ask my colleague Caroline to close it now. So, so we can briefly see the results. What do you see as the biggest challenges for science advice currently? Yeah, there are many different answers. Most of you say making scientific results understandable for policymakers. Yeah, that's always a challenge for science advice, I, I suppose, not only uh, in times of particular uncertainty, but there are also, yeah, several say the speed of political decision making, indeed, and sufficient funding to keep up a scientific excellent base and capacity as the third one. So very interesting answers. I think we will keep much of that still for the discussion uh, and come, to back, uh, come back to this afterwards. But before we do this, I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Mathieu Denis, who will share with us some key insights from his work and a paper that he has co-authored on the principles of and structures of science advice uh, with examples from different countries. So Mathieu, please. Well, thank, you. thank you very much, Annalena, uh, and greetings, everyone. I'm very pleased to be invited to share some thoughts with you and having a discussion with you um, today. Um, Annalena, just uh, the quick results that you've shared with the poll tell me that perhaps um, uh, I'm not needed uh, in this discussion in the sense that I was going to share a few, a few thoughts, a few ideas about the basic principles and structure of scientific advice. I see that people seem to have captured in their response to the poll what really are, I think, uh, uh, the main challenges to scientific advisory mechanisms worldwide. But let me, let me perhaps nonetheless say a few words about principles and structures, but then uh, move to uh, where I think we stand today with scientific advisory mechanism worldwide after two and a half years, three years almost of, of COVID um, and, you know, what are the lessons learned and where, where should we um, go from now? So roughly speaking, colleagues, there are four types of functions that are performed by a scientific advice mechanism. Now, as you know, with such pies, you know, you can always cut in different ways, but but typically there are four types of, of functions that any scientific advice mechanism would seek to perform. One, the first one is to respond to government requests on topic of policy or public interest. That's very obvious. The second one is foresighting. So foresighting would include things like technology assessment, horizon scanning. What are the big upcoming issues that governments should be aware of because they will come their way at some point in, in the near future or in the, the uh, uh, you know, mid, in, in the mid, midterm future. A third function is to mobilize and manage relevant knowledge and provide advice during crises. It's a typical, uh, it's a very specific type of scientific advice. And the fourth function is to serve in science diplomacy capacity, in other words, providing knowledge basis for uh, negotiations for Ministry of Foreign Affairs in their negotiations on issues requiring scientific advice. So these are roughly speaking the four types of function. Now, these functions can be performed by different types of structures. In other words, the scientific advice mechanism structures that, that, that provides the advice will change, will vary from countries to countries according to political traditions, according to the way the constitutions and the way organized interests are um, um, organized in a country. So you have countries that, that will prefer the model of an individual chief science advisor. So that's something you find in New Zealand, in Canada, in Malaysia, that's one model. Certain countries will have a scientific advisory office, like you have in the States, the, U the US Office of Science Technology Policy. Certain countries or certain uh, yeah, countries or regions will have a scientific advisory board. That's what we find in the, uh, in the European um, Commission, in the European context. A country like Japan has a scientific advisory council 
which is similar to a board, but includes participation of stakeholders. And you have countries like Germany's that work with academies primarily and where the scientific advice is provided through the academy. So different structures, the structures vary, but to be effective and fulfill the four functions that I've just briefly mentioned at the beginning, those structures need, must respect a certain number of principles. And those principles, you will recognize them, they're hardly surprising, but they're worth out outlining. They're about independence. Science advice should take the form of honest brokerage, uh, to quote an expert, rather than advocacy. And that requires that the, the, the scientists involved are independent from pressure from the policymaking uh, uh, apparatus. Second principle, legitimacy. Science advice must maintain trust and legitimacy with a mul multitude of, of commun communities, the policy community, the scientific community, uh, and the broader public. And building and maintaining legitimacy will require things like using robust and transparent processes, as much as possible, certain questions, you know. Uh, cannot be fully dealt with transparently, but as much as possible, having transparent process increases trust. Um, they must engage a plurality of perspectives, plurality of disciplines and systems of knowledge. And that includes, for example, the social sciences, which often are not really treated on an equal par in, 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 a, in a board of experts, as well as relevant non-academic knowledge. So the, the in, in engaging a plurality of knowledge systems is important. And you need some very strong public-facing communication. So that was the second, the second principle, legitimacy. The third principle is about relevance. To be effective, a scientific advisory mechanism needs to have access to those components of government that they're going to be dealing with. So you cannot have, say, a scientific advisory board that sits on its own, does its work, and have, has barely uh, any connection with, say, a government. You need to have some truly uh, a mechanism of direct contact and, and, and direct work, and therefore relevance and access with the, the, the appropriate level of decision making. The fourth principle is diversity. I've said a few words about that. I mean, you need the scientific advisory mechanism should comprise a diversity of, of expertise and knowledge culture. And that is important. Diversity is important to help uncover potential hidden biases in the advice that will be provided. So being aware of potential biases in the advice is really, really important. We've seen that during COVID. The fifth um, principle is about reducing uncertainty. And any scientific advisory mechanism, we must remind ourselves of that, of that is about reducing doubt, reducing uncertainty. In other words, clarifying what is known, what is not known, what is knowable, and what is unknowable about an issue. Never try to provide a definitive answer, but really try and reduce uncertainty at every step. So these are you know, functions, different structures, and the basic principles of any good scientific advisory mechanism. Now, if I had a little bit of time, two minutes, I will say a few words about where we are in 2022 um, after, after COVID when it comes to assessing um, our scientific advisory mechanism and capacity worldwide. Um, COVID, I think, colleagues, has performed what we could call an audit of our scientific advice capacity at the global. And what has come out, the image that has come out of this audit is um, the relative weakness of our capacity uh, in doing scientific advisory uh, advice at the global level. On the whole, countries with well-established science advice mechanism responded better. Uh, and on the whole, countries that had to establish an ad hoc scientific advisory mechanism while responding to the crisis were hindered in their capacity to act quickly and effectively. But this being said, we saw shortcomings everywhere.
And so there is there is a general conclusion on the part of the International Science Council, at least, and the people we're you know we're dealing with and talking to, that we must increase capacity pretty much everywhere. Now, again, the structure will change. It's not necessarily the same type of capacity everywhere, but we must increase capacity everywhere. That means investing in knowledge brokerage capacity everywhere, and particularly in developing countries. The other conclusion around the capacity and, and the weak capacity is that short, shortcomings were greater where responses were driven primarily by medical and epidemiological knowledge. And that comes back to a point I was making earlier about the, the, the importance of providing or, or, or uh, uh, taking on board a diversity of perspectives, including knowledge from the social sciences, but also the humanities, taking into consideration the values of the people. If we take COVID, values about you know, life, death, the good life, what's important, etc. These things are, are critically important and must be part of scientific advice um, as well. It's, so there's, a, there's been a, this global audit. A second type of um, conclusion, and that would be my last point really, is that there is urgency now to strengthen scientific advisory mechanisms at the global level. We've seen scientific advisory mechanism at the national level. We've seen sometimes subnational level. There have been issues in both. But uh, the multilateral system at the global level, that was, you know, the lack of effective scientific advisory mechanism there was very, very telling and very, very obvious. I mean, within two and a half years of COVID, we saw virtually no engagement around COVID by the Security Council of the UN. Virtually no meaningful, at least, engagement at the level of the UN General Assembly. We know, we've seen the work of WHO being, being delayed because of competing interests, geopolitical tensions, et cetera. Um, so there, there's, there's some real issue at the global level. We have several mechanisms in place, for sure, of scientific advice, but they don't talk to each other. Not all of them are independent from member states. They don't necessarily have the legitimacy within the scientific community because they're not diverse enough and they're certainly not transparent. And so at the UN level, there's a strong sense that we need a structured system to access the global scientific community, uh, a, a system of scientific ad advice that will reflect the principles that I've highlighted uh, before around independence, legitimacy, relevance, diversity and reducing uncertainty. This could potentially be achieved. Some of you may be aware that the Secretary General has indicated his willingness to reestablish a scientific advisory board for his office. It could be uh, achieved partially by, by that. Um, you may know that there was a, a previous attempt, uh, an exercise in, in, in putting in place a scientific advisory board between 2014, 2016. Um, if we want a new scientific advisory board mechanism for the Secretary General to be effective, we it would need to be a different system from what we had a few years ago. It would need to be, uh, 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 it would need to, to have a, a, a real mandate from the Secretary General's office. It would need to have direct access to his team so that there's uh, interaction that's about relevance. It would need to have a, a dedicated secretariat that really manages the contacts between that scientific advisory board of the Secretary General with the scientific um, community. But it's, it's, it's probably achievable and it would certainly be a step in a good direction. Ultimately, at the multilateral system, what we should aim for, in my opinion, is uh, some clarity and coherence between the different scientific advisory mechanisms that are already in place and to consider a way to uh, have a, a science advice mechanism for the General Assembly. So not only the Secretary, the Secretary General, but also for the General Assembly. And Annalena, this is where I'm gonna end my initial comments. Thank you very much, back to you. Thank you very much, Mathieu. This was uh, very rich um, already. So 
thank you for shedding some light on indeed the, the principles um, and fundamentals of, of science advice and also illustrating already a little bit what are some of the challenges uh, we have with that maybe even at international or global yeah, multilateral level. Um, you mentioned that there are also, uh, of course, different traditions, depending a little bit as well on the, um, yeah, the political system, the political culture, and of course, also uh, on capacity um, of science advice. Um, and then now you're suggesting um, that there should be something done to build this capacity as well in the multilateral, for you mentioned the UN system, with all these different approaches we have and the different capacities how likely do you think it is that we would actually be able to create something like that? Um, and how could it possibly look like um, at U UN level? And also, what should it really focus on? Because, of course, we have different challenges. We mentioned the pandemic, um, but there are other topics. I'm thinking of climate change, of course, and there are already mechanisms in place also at the UN level for this. But do you think there are specific topics such a mechanism should look at and, and to whom it should actually be really reporting? Thank you. You want me to answer now? Yeah. So these are a huge question, Annalena, obviously. And so, you know, um, I'm going to provide my preferred approaches but clearly you know this is all all of this is up for discussion and clearly the decision is in is in the hands of other people in the hands of the the team of the secretary general is it is it is it likely uh is it is it necessary is it useful yes it is highly we we, we need that we saw covid covid just lacked um uh, a real central mechanism to to inform the debates at the level of the un of the United Nations, and we need that. It is it is it is inappropriate to say the least that the Security Council, that's the that's the the, the the strongest structure within that system, deals with security issues, has not dealt with um, with these issues. So we need to rethink the way in which the UN system approaches pandemics and 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 and, and such such crises. Right, and that that in itself requires or raises the question of how are we going to provide science inputs into those those debates. So I think it is. There's no question that it is required. It is important. It's part of the multilateral system uh, reflections on how it can better respond to to um, crises like existential crises like like the pandemic. Now, how what is the favorite format? Look, you know. Again, the decision will be made by the Secretary General in his office if, if it comes to that. I think it would have to be a combination, probably, of models with a, a board of scientists, um, which we saw in the previous attempts. However, it cannot be only a group of 10, 20, whatever, scientists dealing with every single issue. That's, that's barely impossible. So you need to have a group of scientists, but with direct capacity and connections with the broader and global scientific community so that they're able to put in place working groups of experts on different different issues. And then that scientific advisory board really is the mechanism, the clear, clearing house, if you want, of the work of broader groups. So a mix between, say, uh, a scientific advisory board like you have in the European Union, the commission on the one hand, with something like the network of academies that you will find in Germany and in, in Canada is probably the best model. And what would they need to do? They would need, I think, essentially do two things. They would need to agree with the secretary generals on the agenda, their agenda of work. And that would be a mix of topics that are important to the secretary general that he wants to bring into the, the, the workings of the General Assembly in the UN with uh, foresighting that this scientific advisory board will do. So the issues and priorities that this group of people feel need to be put on the agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, Mathieu, for this. Um, I think what now we have already heard a little bit from sort of the international level, and we would come now to a concrete example with Philip Nolan. Philip, if you could switch your camera on. Um, you have uh, experience with all of this very concretely in Ireland. And um, I'm happy to give you the floor now to share 
how scientific advice worked during the COVID-19 pandemic in Ireland and give us also some more general points that you think are important also beyond your national example. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Annalena. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to um, explain really my personal experience as much as our national experience of providing very specific scientific advice during the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, there are really interesting resonances uh, between um, what I have to say and what Matthew has just said. Um, so I do think even though this is a very specific and very contextualized experience, we can generalize a little bit from uh, what happened in Ireland to the principles uh, that, that Matthew has just outlined. And we didn't plan this. So the fact that I'm going to say some things that are really quite similar to what Matthew has, says, it has said, uh, you should take that as a form of confirmation uh, rather than prior agreement. So it is interesting to me that coming from different perspectives, me arguing from the specific to the general, and uh, Matthew argue, arguing from a, a global evaluation to, to the general, uh, we came to some very similar conclusions. So um, just let me give you a little bit of background to my experience. I, I was, as has been mentioned, chair of the Irish Epidemiological Modeling Advisory Group. And that was an ad hoc structure. So uh, Ireland's a small country, 5 million people. Uh, our public health system uh, is very expert and very experienced, but not particularly well resourced and not particularly well connected to the university system and to the academic system. And unlike many other countries, including small countries, we had no formal national advanced biostatistics uh, or disease modeling infrastructure. So uh, when the COVID pandemic arrived and many countries uh, were using biostatistical analyses and modeling um, in order to uh, literally uh, understand the likely trajectory of the pandemic and how it might be managed, we had no such infrastructure. And in a very short time, in the space of a week, uh, uh, not long after we notified our first case, um, uh, we mobilized a group. Um, the 8th of March 2020 was a Sunday, and at 08.30 in the morning, I got a telephone call from the chief medical officer asking me a simple question. Do we have anybody in this country who does mathematical modeling of infectious disease? Um, and by the end of that week, uh, we did. Um, so our job was to monitor and model the pandemic. Um, uh, we called ourselves uh, the Irish Epidemiological Modeling Advisory Group. And when I say we had people who could monitor and model the pandemic, none of them uh, were employed or funded to do so. Uh, all of them were um, uh, professional colleagues in public health or mostly uh, academic colleagues in the university system who were funded to research other things but could pivot in a very agile manner uh, to work on the COVID-19 pandemic. And this community uh, comprised applied mathematicians. Um, for instance, one of the applied mathematicians was actually modeling the diffusion of information on Twitter. Uh, statisticians, computer scientists, geospatial scientists, epidemiologists and specialists in public health from within our public health community. And the membership grew very dynamically as we needed to do different things uh, we recruited different members and assembled them into four working groups. But you might imagine that sharing a 50 member group would be difficult. Uh, frankly, it wasn't because the task was specific and clear and people knew what they were doing. And we reported into a wider national public health emergency team called NEFIT. And when I accepted this job, I expected it to be a um, backroom exercise, a, a classic piece of academic chairing, uh, bringing, bringing academics to common purpose, which um, is something I had a lot of experience of as a university president. But, but surprisingly, and it was quite the experience, uh, this group became quite central to national policy formation uh, and pandemic communications. And one thing I want to point out, the first, there, there were one of two happy accidents in, in, in the development of this group. And, and the first accident was because we had no formal pre-existing structure, we had to work with the people we could find and the people we had. And we, we brought together a very interdisciplinary group. Uh, it was very diverse in terms of the range of expertise, 
and it was very engaged. So on the one extreme, we had applied mathematicians who think in the abstract. On the other extreme, we had working public health doctors who were concerned about the management of the individual cases and outbreaks in their region and in their community. So, so if as a design principle, as Matthew has outlined, you're looking for diversity, interdisciplinarity, and real engagement in, in real world problems, we pretty much got this by accident, and it was a very happy and very important uh, accident. So what did we find ourselves doing? First of all, we found we had a huge task that uh, we were ill-prepared um, for the very uh, primary activity of simply gathering data on where were the cases and, and where was the infection spreading and how severe was it. So we had a really tough job to do simply bringing cases together and then applying straightforward biostatistical and epidemiological analyses to those. And that's illustrated in the top left uh, of the uh, four pictures that I'm showing you there, which is the number of daily reported cases from March 2020 to early February 2022, uh, with the incorporation of diff different testing regimens, including antigen testing. And these data were coming from three or four different systems and needed to be integrated. Before we could do any modeling uh, of the infection, uh, a large group of epidemiologists dominated by veterinary epidemiologists, interestingly, because human epidemiologists are much more focused on non-communicable diseases at the moment. And our core expertise in infectious diseases was actually in, in animal and one health uh, approaches to infectious disease. We needed to synthesize the evidence and, and these groups sat down and went through all of the emerging literature uh, on COVID-19, looking at latent period, serial interval, incubation time, and all of the, these data and, uh, that we needed for reliable models uh, and generated uh, clear evidence syntheses. And then we could go about building scenario models of what, would, what is likely to happen in the face of different public policy interventions. And one of those models is illustrated on the top right uh, this is a uh, model presented to government, uh, and you can see three panels in that we were saying to government, this was in early 2021, when government was considering relieving a lot of the restrictions that we'd had to impose after the winter, just as vaccination was coming on board. And what this model shows is if the government delayed four to eight weeks, uh, the likelihood of a fourth wave of infection was very much reduced. You'll also see each of those has confidence intervals. And this brings me to a second generalizable principle. Uh, it's very important to engage with government and the public, actually, uh, on the uncertainty in science. Um, and that, that we can't predict the future. We can't know what's going to happen with any uh, absolute certainty. But we can reduce the uncertainty. And I'll be honest and say, when this model was presented to government, one minister said, uh, looking at the range of those confidence rules, what you're telling us is you've no idea what's going to happen. Uh, to which we responded, no, uh, we're telling you what we think is most likely to happen. It's more likely than not, we'll follow the middle of those trajectories, but uh, it's possible that we'll deviate from that model by quite a wide range, and that depends on a range of scenarios. So it's about reducing uncertainty, not eliminating it. Unexpectedly, uh, down to the bottom left, um, uh, and also accidentally, from a very early period, uh, the National Public Health Emergency Team offered direct communication to the public. There were daily press conferences, then twice weekly press conferences, and ultimately weekly press conferences, where we would outline the state of the pandemic the basis for any advice that we were offering, and we take questions uh, from journalists. None of us expected that role. Uh, and, and the second happy accident was that that started very early, independent of formal government communications. So there was an independent science and public health advisory voice direct to the public, where the public understood why we were advising what we were advising. Government sometimes deviated from that advice. There were wider political and societal considerations, uh, but the public could see both things happening and in terms of their own individual decision-making, uh, both in how they responded to government uh, restrictions or government advice uh, 
and how they responded to our advice and the basis for it. Uh, there was a very strong influence on public behavior and very high trust, uh, both in public health advice and in government. And then finally, and importantly, we ended up giving direct advice to government. And the bottom right picture, if anybody in Ireland will recognize that as, as the frequent uh, appearance of myself in the middle, the deputy chief medical officer, and on the right, the chief medical officer, uh, trotting the lonely path to government buildings to deliver yet again uh, uh, unwelcome advice, perhaps, or, or bad news to government. Uh, and what did we learn from all this? Well, it's interesting. I think, I think the first thing was that even though we had no formal structure to provide the very detailed analyses required and the sophisticated advice to government, we could assemble it very quickly simply because, and it's interesting that it came up in the poll, uh, we had funded these people right across uh, the higher education system. One of the things that I think we were slow to do um, is because of the ta because the task of mobilizing the technical work uh, around monitoring and modeling the pandemic, because that was such a big task, uh, we were too slow and too incomplete in drawing the social and behavioral sciences and the humanities into the discussion. Uh, and, and that's a key learning for us. The second thing is that um, formal and established structures are useful, uh, but this was ad hoc. And as a result of being ad hoc was agile and dynamic. Um, and I think it's important not to be afraid of change, uh, not to have formal structures become too restrictive and to be open to being, and, uh, to being ad hoc, to being agile, uh, to recruiting new people and, and new advice and, and re-diversifying uh, your scientific advisory structures as the problem evolved. Um, there is a discipline to systematic review of the literature and evidence synthesis. Uh, and, and all too often that's overlooked. Um, it's perfectly feasible to mobilize that on an emergency basis and do rapid reviews. And one of the challenges that we found throughout this pandemic is uh, there, there are an awful lot of individuals in the scientific community with opinions. Uh, and opinions are not evidence. And it was important to us uh, to have processes in place that would systematically assemble the evidence and try and, and create a, an expertise-based consensus of what that evidence was showing. Interestingly for us, having um, quantitative and modeling-based approaches, uh, government found that exceptionally useful uh, to the point actually where a senior civil servant said to me last week, they're addicted to data now, quote unquote. Um, and I would say, however, that it's, uh, there, was, there was talk earlier about evidence-based policy. In evidence-based policy and evidence-based medicine, too frequently uh, the individual voice and the context can, can somehow get lost in the very formal evidence-based thinking. So I think we need to we, we need to take our quantitative and even our qualitative research and imbue into that the stories of communities and the stories of uh, individuals. You could think about balancing evidence-based policy with some extent of narrative-based policy. How does the individual actually actually experience what's going on? I think it's really important that there's a deliberate pun in here um, about communicating uncertainty with confidence or specifically in our case, confidence intervals. Um, it's really important uh, in communicating both with the public and the political system uh, to emphasize this, this, this fact that uh, Matthew already alluded to. Uh, we're not eliminating uncertainty, uh, we're simply reducing it. And in that context, um, one of the biggest challenges we found was was a frequent enough um, clash between the formal advice that we might offer government and the critique of that advice by colleagues in the wider uh, scientific and academic community. Um, and, and, and sometimes that critique was legitimate, uh, but other times um, it was um, unhelpful. Um, there, there is a mantra there, there has been a mantra there about following the science. We must follow their science. Uh, 
But anybody who's engaged in science realizes there is no such thing as a death science. Uh, scientific knowledge is contested, it's contingent, it's emergent uh, when things are changing rapidly. So far too often, um, colleagues in the wider community confused opinion with advice. Uh, opinion is one individual's reading of the scientific literature, and the scientific literature around COVID-19 was huge. Advice is a systematic process of assembling what evidence we have, trying to forge some consensus, trying to put uncertainty parameters around that consensus, and delivering it as advice uh, to the political system. And then finally, we were in the fortunate position of being in the public mind and in the political mind independent. To a certain extent, as I say, that was an accident. Uh, it occurred because we were established on an ad hoc basis and opened an independent line of communication with the public. And that independence is essential, but, and as, as Matthew has already alluded to, in my experience, there's a whole lot of other things that are essential to humility, uh, some empathy with the political mission, uh, trust between the political system and their advisors, persistence and resilience if your advice is rejected. But above all, um, there's the famous quote attributed to Winston Churchill, I don't know if he said it, that uh, democracy is an appalling system until you can consider the alternatives. Um, uh, you really do have to respect your role as an advisor. You're there to advise. It's the political system that has the democratic mandate uh, to uh, decide. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, this was a very rich uh, presentation with uh, indeed making a lot of reference as well to things that uh, Mathieu said uh, about the principles uh, of science advice before and, and illustrating this um, at the with a case of, of Ireland. You were talking a lot about happy accidents in that yeah. whole story, um, which I would like to uh, come back to uh, as, as one point um, before we go to, to the next presentation. Um, what would you say uh, retrospectively or, or or maybe actually for the future if you were to learn from this experience what would you um say to universities about their role and in preparing researchers and scientists for um the particular role of science advice what could they do better for the future so that we don't have to rely on too many happy accidents so I, I, I think um, two things, uh, independence and independence of communication from the outset, that, that a scientific advisory structure is established and it's established as a separate, uh, independent with an authoritative voice. And the second is uh, inclusion, diversity, interdisciplinarity and engagement, that, that it isn't an isolated, as Matthew says, it's not an isolated group um, of highly qualified academics. It's academics and practitioners working together on what is the problem. Uh, are these um, useful articulations of the problem uh, to policy? And are your models or solutions applicable in the world in which we practice? So that academic practitioner engagement, I think, is vital. And then the third thing, I think, is preparation for the fact that if, if you if you want to sustainably engage the political system with your advice, there's a certain discipline. Um, you, you, it, to be quite blunt, you, you can't be kind of some kind of public intellectual star on the one stage saying whatever uh, charismatic and compelling thing comes into your mind on television and then expect government to trust and calmly listen to your advice the next day. So there's, there's a preparation required about the discipline of offering advice in a clear, measured, empathetic, and humble manner. And if that advice is rejected, you take that as being part of the job and think about how you might articulate your advice next time. You don't go out in public and critique government for not taking your advice because they won't ask you the next time. And that's just the truth of it. So there's a certain kind of, which we learned the hard way. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, we learned, very much learned that the hard way. Um, so that kind of preparation for the, the reality of what engagement between advisors and the political system is, is like, is essential. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you very much. With that, I think we come now to uh, another example from Finland, Jakko Kosmanen. Um, I'm happy to give you the floor to present us with a new um, science advice mechanism that you are currently testing in Finland and which turns, I would say, a little bit upside down the usual process of, of science advice. So I'm curious to hear from you about that. Thank you, Annalena, and thank you, Matthew and Philip, as well, for, for the previous uh, talks. I, I very much um, reflect on and, and recognize also many of the challenges and, and issues that you, you brought up. In, and, and this basically builds on it, uh, but arrives to the same topic from a slightly different angle. Um, the, the starting point is the kind of motivation for, uh, you know, re renewing and, and re building the science advice mechanisms in the light of also the um, kind of the lessons that we've learned from COVID. And uh, so uh, this basically looks at uncertainty and complexity more broadly than just simply uh, looking at how to respond to pandemics or COVID. Uh, so a little bit of background to it. So uh, that those of you who don't know uh, what red teaming is, so red teaming is effectively, it is a method that is used both in foresight uh, an intelligence community and cybersecurity, where one team builds uh, a hypothesis, a product, a claim, an argument, uh, and then another team comes in and tests the tenacity, uh, the validity, the functionality of the, the hypothesis, the product, or the topic. So it's basically it's a dialogue between two communities. And what we wanted to do is try to test see if how much we can translate and transport this type of of methodology in the context of policy making in in relation to complex policy topics. Uh, so just a short background. So we had a th three year publicly funded experimental initiative called SOFI, Science Advice Initiative of Finland, where we tested several of these type of new operating models. Um, and then with our aim was to build a more permanent functioning uh, science policy platform within Finland. And, uh, you know, relating to reflecting on what Matthew said about the traditional roles of different institutions, it was somewhat surprising that the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters actually provided a permanent budget, an annual budget for, for the initiative's work. So the initiative was integrated into the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters, and we continue our experimental work and building the new science advice models at the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters as the Finnish Academy of Science and Letters. So uh, our basically our development work used a lot of design oriented methodologies. So we started from trying to find the actual needs and the gaps within the science policy ecosystem in Finland. Uh, we interviewed about 300 civil servants, scientists, politicians, uh, university uh, administrations, funders, etc. And something, there was a lot of challenges that were repeated, and I won't go into all of the operating models that we built, but um, one was the, one challenge was that the kind of, the rigid science advice operating models that are built around question and answer logic do not sufficiently uh, address uh, complex policy topics. So the usual commission reports, expert hearings, and expert statements, while as such they're quite valuable in the in the science policy ecosystem, they also can lead to a mosaic of evidence that are there's a lot of that are left behind it. And uh, while we didn't know what was actually needed by the policy drafters, they said that the existing models um, are still insufficient, especially in complex policy topics. Um, and if we turn around, basically, the idea of evidence informed policy making uh, in interconnected complex topics, it's in principle terms, it's an infinite amount of evidence that you need, basically, or you could potentially have uh, in uh, informing the policy making, but that's unfeasible, basically, as well. Um, so we thought, what could we do about this topic? And what we tried to do is we turned around the question and answer logic. So instead of the, the government, the politicians or the policy drafters coming with the question for the scientific community to answer, um, the policy drafters come with an early proposal, um, a policy draft, a hypothesis about what the either the state of play or a hypothesis about a policy draft, a policy objective, or a relationship between a means and an objective objective. Um, and then we bring a scientific team to try to tenacity of, 
of the, the proposal, the hypothesis from an evidence-informed scientific perspective. So basically the red teaming is effectively, it's an explorative dialogic space for policy drafters and scientists. So in one way is that you could say that it tries to uncover the known unknowns and the unknown knowns uh, in the proposals, in the hypothesis. So um, effectively not eliminating uncertainties, but try to limit the uncertainties that are related to those proposals. Um, and depending on the mandate, it can either uh, involve just the testing of early hypothesis. Uh, and I mentioned here early because some things that are important here is that I, we are using policy documents. Uh, either it is the challenge definitions, either it is the very early draftings of the objectives, either it's the very early drafting of the means. And then we use uh, insights from scientists to try to test those. And I also mentioned insights because I think it's much more than simply providing evidence to it. So uh, as previous speakers also mentioned, uh, for example, we've been uh, using the red teaming in, in helping the government to draft the national climate adaptation plan. And what they need in the plan, for example, is, a, is a, uh, an ethical but operationalizable definition of vulnerability. And with vulnerability, if you give it simply to the economist to answer, they'll just say something like 65 to 72 uh, years old, living in these and these type of situations in these kind of income brackets. But then when you bring social anthropologists, you bring systems theorists, you bring legal experts and others to try to look into it from different perspective, you realize that it's much more complex uh, complex. Uh, theme and definition. So what we do is we let the government to do a very early draft uh, proposal of the definition of vulnerability. And then we brought in a multidisciplinary team to try to analyze it, basically break it apart and then rebuild it. So depending on the mandate, it can either be just simply deconstructing and, and analyzing the proposals from uh, policy uh, from from evidence in for perspective, or then it can be also co-designing of pathways forward, uh, depending what the government gives to the red team as their mandate. So in practical terms, what we've used it for is a look into early challenge definitions provided by the governments, look at policy objectives, are the objectives feasible themselves, or are the means uh, and objectives objectives in a reasonable uh, connection to each other. How is the extent impact assessment done? We also look at things like meta-level issues like impact assessment frameworks and tools. Like for example, a lot of these topics like climate uh, adaptation plan is still uh, very early also for governments to try to, uh, to understand how it should be done in both practical terms and in both using the best available evidence. Uh, for example, how can we do with practical tools uh, uh, cost effectiveness analysis of the relationship between the means and the objectives um, when we only have a few months of time? What, we don't have the practical tools already at hand. So what can we do? And then we also give the, uh, the, the scientists the floor to, to try to analyze what are the kind of the, is there uh, gaps in the, like the, what is the latest research say in relation to the objectives? So we use usually between five to 10 scientists in a team, multidisciplinary teams. We have about five to 10 civil servants. Uh, we use the boundary objects in between them. We do workshops between one to three, uh, which last about one to four hours. And uh, these are the kind of topics that we've used them in. Uh, so uh, they're all kind of system level, quite complex policy topics. Um, the initial feedback has been uh, very good. So we started from one ministry and we scaled up to seven. Uh, so we've got uh, the good word has been passed around. Both sides give uh, the, um, the sessions uh, nine out of 10, roughly both sides. So scientists and uh, the policymakers believe it's very valuable. Uh, we're still trying to identify and analyze is, is what exactly it is that we're doing uh, right here. But uh, we'd say that we have some sort of uh, proof of concept here. And we've been also accepted by the government uh, to, to work on these more closely. And so, so it's a start of a, so we've, the, for the past couple of years, we've been experimenting on these and the, the experimental work building still continues. But I think it's uh, something that we're touching up upon something which we're starting to find still what exactly it is. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Jaco, for presenting us with this sort of innovative and new approach to um, science advice and policy making. Um, if 
people would wish to try this in, in their context in, in other countries or what what would you advise them? What are the conditions that you think need to be there that this um, kind of approach can work? Are there specific topics that it lends itself to or other conditions? So, so we're trying to find the limits of it, but I think it's quite scalable what we've found from public sector strategy to National, national, national Nature Conservation Act, for example. So I think it's a quite broad range of topics that it can be used. I think first is to have buy-in and trust from the government. Uh, which is can be because these are doing new things. And as I mentioned, these are tapping into early proposals, which requires a lot of trust uh, and from both sides, actually, the, the, the policymakers to open up the policy process and give their early proposals instead of just simply coming with questions. So, uh, but that's, it's helpful if you uh, frame it as experimentation, that's always helpful. And if you get a mandate from the top of the ministries or the government, whatever it is, so you have the, the curious champions of civil servants, you have the mandate from the top and you frame it as experimentation, that's already a good avenue forward. Use boundary objects, that creates the dialogue much closer than rather than talking past each other. Obviously, a lot of challenges remain, but uh, uh, it requires new type of mindsets and new type of culture uh, introducing, but... Uh, but I think there's a promise there and uh, yeah, it's uh, happy to just give me a call and I'll give you more details about it. Yeah, thank you very much. I would um, like to get um, the other speakers, Philip and Mathieu back as well. Um, we are running a little bit late, but I think we can sort of give ourselves a couple of more minutes, maybe just to um, discuss uh, couple of, of questions that came up um, also in the q and I see there is a lively exchange going on also between participants um, and there are questions around yeah yeah the discussion about uh, reducing uncertainty or to what extent actually introduce the concept of uncertainty also to the public and to policymakers as part of the scientific process and, and how to do that. I would like to bring back the, um, the discussion a bit to, uh, since we are an association of universities and also concerned with um, how universities can uh, yeah, help with all of this, contribute to all of this. What would you say um, could universities do to actually help improving science advice um, uh, to policymaking? Is there anything that they can do with regard to any topic uh, that we actually had in the discussion. I'm thinking about interdisciplinarity, preparing researchers for their role and things you've already touched upon. Um, any of you would like to start on this? Well, if I'll just quickly continue while I was uh, earlier speaking. So I think I would agree with Matthew's uh, initial conclusion. And I'd say from my personal experience working with universities, I think that uh, comparatively to the academic competences and the uh, the quality and the scale and the, uh, the the amount of research being done in universities, disproportionately marginal amount is invested in knowledge brokerage capacities. I think that's something that is completely or almost completely lacking in many places. And I think that is the key. So if you don't uh, build the bridges, you really can't, you know, uh, kind of you know, push the science onwards as well and, and pass on the good message. I, th I, th I think if I may, if I may come in, um, uh, Philip, I, I think there's also, there is indeed something that universities can do in terms of training both scientists in their, in their brokerage capacity, synthesis capacity, um, but also learning, learning to respect what policymakers are doing uh, and the humility that Philip was talking about, I think, is important here as well. So I, I sense in some of the exchanges, it's, uh, there seems to be a suggestion that it would be enough, for instance, for policymakers to be put in contact with, with experts on a given issue. I don't think that's true. I think you need, you need to, build, to build trust. I, the policymakers, the community you're working with needs to have trust and that is just not a direct interaction uh, with just any scientist on a given issue it needs to be done through mechanisms and people that 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 are that are trusted i think in the the, the training of diplomats 
there is something to do in terms of how you you deal and work with uh, scientific inputs in international negotiations. I see it in a lot of diplomacy schools and, and, and policy schools. Uh, I think there, there's more that can be done there as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that slightly by saying, like, like, first of all, universities provide the talent base. So we just need to remember not to forget that um, and to continue to fund and develop the talent base. The second thing is within the system, a lot of my colleagues said the kind of work we're doing here is not rewarded within our incentive structures. Uh, this is time away from my core business and my university doesn't know what to do with it. Um, and the third thing that I, 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 I'll just echo Matthew's uh, comments there. I, I, it'd be a useful conversation. The way we contest science, and science is deliberately contested as a way of kind of proving it. I, I mean that in one sense of the word. Political contestation is different. And the way we set policy is different yet again. And you can't bring in your normal mode of scientific contestation. You know, you're completely wrong about that <laughs> to the mode of setting policy, which is much more collaborative, uh, much more um, contingent, and where context is so complex compared with the more abstract circumstance in which we normally contest science. So recognizing the mode of contestation is fundamentally different and you need to prepare for it is um is important and it's actually quite damaging it for us to do to contest science the way we normally do through argument in public because then the public just turns around and say, to, as, says as the minister you have no idea what what you're talking about um so it just di different different cultures of contestation are important to acknowledge Yeah, th thank you very much. This is um, already very rich and we could actually continue, I think, with another <laughs> webinar on exploring some of these questions further. Unfortunately, we don't have time for that today, but I would just like um, to take up as a last thought what um, I think many of the contributions you've given all also point to. Uh, that actually evidence-based policymaking or this idea you just put information into the system or the policymakers and then, you know, it will naturally come, something will come out of that in terms of political decision-making. That, of course, doesn't work like this. Philip used the word uh, uh, narrative-based policymaking, which I found quite interesting because I think it brings in besides the data, which I think we think often more... Um, of in terms of quantitative data, you were mentioning mathematical modeling or uh, data from um, you know, also the natural science, it brings in this other element and comes back also to the question of interdisciplinarity uh, and bringing back uh, sort of the human aspect and the, the, the lived experience also, as we have seen with the example of the pandemic. And I think this bringing it back to the question of what can universities do interdisciplinarity is actually a big, big topic where universities still have to work on and how to actually make this um, happening uh, uh, in an even better way from the education of the student uh, to the actual research and then the science advice to policymaking. And that is also a big topic that we've um, identified as something for universities they would wish to work on uh, in Universities Without Walls, EOA's vision for universe, Europe's universities in 2030, um, which I come back to now because this actually built the basis for our webinar series here on universities and democracy, uh, where this part of sort of, um, uh, yeah, universities' contribution to democratic societies was identified as one of the main themes. And with that, we are actually at the end of our webinar today. Thank you very much uh, to all the speakers and also all the participants for the lively contributions. We are also at the end actually of this series, uh, Universities and Democracy. It was the last of three webinars. Um, if you want to share it or re-watch it, you can do this uh, um, on the UA YouTube channel and there you can also find the other two webinars, one on
um, civic engagement and another one on science communication, which is actually very close to some of the topics we've discussed today, because there is, of course, a relation between how you communicate uh, science and the scientific method and also how you, pr you provide advice to policymaking. With that, thank you very much. And um, yeah, hope to see you at other EU events and continue this um, very interesting conversation about science and policymaking.